This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins on the local news roundup. North Carolina enters phase one of a four phase reopening of the economy. Synchronize your watches. It starts at 5 p.m. today. We are reopening despite the state not meeting White House standards for doing so. And even as COVID-19 tracking project shows that North Carolina ranks near the bottom of all states in terms of testing. The city proposes a new budget for next year, reflecting the impact of the virus-driven economic downturn, but it isn't as draconian as it might have been, and schools will open earlier this August as educators make decisions on how to recover lost learning once school returns to classrooms. Our roundtable of reporters is ready to dig into those stories and more. Ann Doss Helms is here for WFAE News. Good morning, Ann. Good morning. Joe Bruno is a reporter for WSOC TV Channel 9 Eyewitness News. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Jonathan Lowe is a reporter anchor for Spectrum News. Jonathan, welcome. Good morning, Mike. And Mary C. Curtis is here. She is a columnist for Roll Call and a contributor to WCCB TV. Good morning to you. Good morning. We're all here on Zoom. We're Zooming into your homes. Last (laughs) Friday, there were 10,703 cases of coronavirus in the state and 397 deaths this morning. The number has risen to 13,563 cases and 518 deaths. That means things are still going up. But at 5 p.m. today, we are entering phase one of a four-phase reopening of commerce. Are we throwing in the towel? Some experts say we're jumping the gun on this, and we've just said we can't can't win, so let's just go on with life. Are we throwing in the towel? We're starting to see some uh, higher spikes in the amount of daily cases that are added to the DHHS dashboard. And one of the reasons for that is we're finally able to expand our testing capacity. So as we get more positive tests, there's going to be more positive, excuse me, as we get more tests, there are going to be more positive cases. Uh, The DHHS, when I spoke to them yesterday, they're, you know, defending the plan to go into phase one because they say we're hitting our metrics, we are either level or we are decreasing in all the right areas, and it is time to start easing restrictions just a little bit. I, I think, uh, go ahead. Go on, John. I, I was just going to say, I think there, this is the best balance between the pressure that we saw last week from all the reopened NC protests, uh, some in the, the business community, um, that have been pressuring the governor. And and he did acknowledge that earlier this week when um, they announced moving to phase one, um, that, you know, that they want to help the business community start to to get back to some sort of normalcy. Uh, So I do think that this is, we're not sort of a jump the gun, but a best balance between continuing to flatten the curve and, and work towards um, reducing community spread and also uh, acknowledging that there has been an impact on the big business community. You can see, though, that the governor in North Carolina, they're trying to be cautious, more cautious than some states like Georgia that are opening more broadly, uh, because uh, you can see from the White House that they're pretty much putting it on the states and the governors. And they're saying, you know, encouraging the, them to reopen. But if there is a spike, you can see they will also be blaming the governors for opening too soon. So uh, the governor was saying, and the health officials wear, wash and wait, you know, wear a head covering, even though it's not mandatory in some places, uh, make sure you sanitize and keep up with the social distancing. And a lot of it is, will people be more comfortable? I think they're going to Mm -hmm. wait and see, are people just going to come out? And polls are saying that most people, despite the reopen protests that you've been seeing around the country, that most people actually want to err on the side of being cautious. But um, if you go so, out. Yeah. And so the, the testing as well, you will see uh, that they want to ramp up the testing because, as you know, North Carolina has been low in that, particularly among, you see, Black and brown communities that have wanted uh, more testing in their communities uh, to see what the risk is. They have moved the uh, peak date again. I think it's the third or fourth time that they've moved it out. It's now July 14th. That will be when they are predicting the peak of cases in Mecklenburg County. And that's exactly what was supposed to happen as we flattened the curve. We are reducing the number of cases that are going into hospitals, but we're spreading it out. There are not as many at one time, but we're spreading it out. Are we likely to see this peak date moved again as we reopen and start increasing people's exposure to the virus? Or are we 
likely to see the peak date come sooner. Does anybody know? You're not saying it's always an extrapolation, so you can't be sure. Right. And that's right. why it changes so often. Yeah. And, so and, and, and in these and next in the two weeks, you could see things go up or you could see, you know, oh, maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought. And in the back of our minds, remember, Mike, that we are still looking at uh, the, the, the further out that they push that peak, peak date, the closer we are to uh, flu season and that, that second spike that they are talking about in the fall winter time. Yeah. The and, way that and, University of Penn model works, though, it's the better you social distance, the further out the peak gets. And I think we're going to see our uh, we're, the numbers are going to show that we're social distancing a little uh, worse off now as restrictions start to lift. So I think that that peak will either stay in July or might inch a little closer uh, to our current date. And I, I, one point on this, we will know, I think the, the, the health director, Gibby Harris, said this yesterday, uh, the state of health official said, we'll know in two weeks how this right. phase one transition, where we see the data go. So, you know, we'll know really quickly if that peak date, what's going to happen with it based on when, what happens yeah. with this phase one. And that's, that's because of the 14 day incubation period on this. If you want you're exposed, it takes about 14 days for you to show yeah. symptoms. In, in the face, as what somebody said on this panel a moment ago, in the face of mounting pressure, the, govern, uh, the governor uh, has decided it's time now to relax things. We have examined this carefully and believe the data shows us that now is the time to begin easing these restrictions. And we're doing it cautiously and carefully and as if to underline that decision, State Health Director Mandy Cohen says the metrics justified the first phase of reopening. We're not perfect, but we're stable. So phase one begins at 5 p.m. today. How will that change our world in Mecklenburg County, Joe? There's a couple different things here that phase one allows. Uh, malls and other businesses that were previously closed are allowed to reopen at 5 p.m. today. That excludes the close contact businesses like nail salons, barber shops, hair salons, tattoo parlors, things of that nature. Restaurants still can't bring back their uh, dining room areas and bars can't reopen yet. But malls, different boutiques, they can reopen their doors. The other thing in phase one that stands out to me is you can now visit with friends as long as you stay outside and it's less than 10 people. So they're no longer discouraging that non-essential gathering. If you want to have a small little party outside, that's fine, just social distance. And then of course, state parks are allowed to reopen. Daycares can reopen for non-essential employees as well. Those are really the major things that stand out to me in phase one. The stay at home order is still in effect. It's just modified to allow those activities. And, and I don't know if Joe mentioned this, but restaurants still have to do takeout and delivery. So they cannot have a situation where the phase one does not include restaurants being able in bars, being able to reopen. The stay-at-home order, as Joe mentioned, that is in effect now. Now, I find it interesting that when we move to phase two, that's lifted. So we'll make a pretty big transition going from phase one to phase two. Yeah. And for many people in North Carolina, in this area particularly, worship services, uh, you can have them outdoors. They still ask for you to social distance. And so um, that also will be a part of phase one. And the well, there are, there are really almost two questions. There are the rules and regulations, which we've outlined, and then there's the psychology of this. And I think that's going to be interesting to see whether people really view this as, wow, this is great. We can just get out and do whatever we want now, because I think a lot of us going out and about, whether it's for assignments or running errands, by definition, you don't see the people who are most staying at home, but you see a lot of people who are out without masks, who just seem to be kind of, you know, yeah, let's get back to normal. You hear some of the political tension around that, you know, give us our freedom. So it's going to be interesting to see how people take this, no matter what the rules are. Mike, I, I, with the, the retail stores part of this, um, it, it is important to know that the businesses have been working with the state and local officials on this to figure out what are the regulations going to be. So they still will have limits on the amount of people that can be inside the store uh, per that, that building's square footage. Um, but there are already stores now that are have kind of set the bar, if you will, like Lowe's and Home Depot and, and some of the local mom and pop shops that have been able to remain open as being essential businesses already have things in place like um, 
iPads and these little scanners when you're at the door, counting how many people are going in and counting those people as they leave. Many of those stores already have corrals in the front that are spaced out, tape on the floor, and the same as inside the store. So I will say that there, you know, the businesses here locally that are going to be reopening already kind of are working on, if they don't already, have protocols prepared for five o'clock today. I've None even had my temperature checked too. So ah. I can tell you, uh, I'm 97.5 as of yesterday. So some of <laughs> Even Where checking people's temperature. So Where was that? I haven't seen that yet. Oh, is that my chiropractor's office? Okay. None of, none of the states reopening for business, including ours, have met the guidelines that the White House set for doing so. So now we're hearing from the White House and others that we can't stay closed forever. So I guess that's okay to not meet the standards. But yesterday, I asked Mecklenburg County Health Director Gibby Harris if she and other officials were feeling pressure uh, if economic concerns were being put ahead of public health concerns. The reality is <clears throat> this virus is in our communities. It's not going away. We don't have a vaccine. And so people are going to become infected whether we open up or not. Um, the question is, can we manage that in a way that we are not putting those most at risk in a situation where they can be exposed? Um, and those are... Um, the elderly and those with chronic conditions. And uh, the other question is, um, can we manage the new infections in a way that does not overwhelm our healthcare system? Um, people are going to become infected because this is in our community. And until we have a vaccine, um, there is no way for us to get rid of COVID-19. Right. Um, and even once we have a vaccine, that's not going to happen. So we've been working to lower the curve. It's worked. And now we'll be living in a world where we will be trying to manage inevitable contagion, it seems to me. Is that what you heard in those remarks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she's just been so careful, I feel like, up until this point and like warning people about this and taking that cautious approach. And then it's almost like she had a new tune yesterday where her stance on this is like it's inevitable that we're going to get COVID-19. So, well, so does that answer my question? Are, are public health officials feeling the pressure, the political pressure of economic concerns and bowing to them? I think that is the case uh, in some ways. Uh, it, it is a message coming from the White House, which had these guidelines, but there have been contradictions as well. They have rejected some of the findings of their own health experts and CDC, uh, and, say, and they've been encouraging uh, economics to open. You could see today uh, the, the most recent unemployment numbers at 14.7%. There's a pressure to, to get the economy moving, although not as much of an acknowledgement that if people are getting sick, that will also depress the economy. Uh, so we can see uh, these warring health and political concerns from the top. And obviously that message is coming uh, to some of the states. Now, not in North Carolina in particular, but in some states, some of the governors are also rejecting uh, and almost suppressing some of the health findings uh, of their own experts. So this is something that we have seen happen. Uh, even as break, in the White House, the president's own valet has Super tested Mark, positive. Testing, we'll be talking about education and more on Charlotte Talks and the local news roundup. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Atrium Health, providing information to the community through various resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. Information about the coronavirus available to all at atriumhealth.org slash coronavirus. And the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, introducing CLT Business United, a new resource for the Charlotte business community, including area survey findings and daily emails to keep everyone informed. Charlotte Region. Dot com. Coming up on Politics Monday, the process of picking a running mate for Joe Biden is underway. The vice presidency used to just be a consolation prize for the runner-up in the presidential race. The job has become much more significant since then, and there has been eight times in U.S. history when the vice president suddenly was thrust into the top job. Author Jared Cohen shares the stories of these accidental presidents and their impacts on history Monday on this program at 9. 
the White House faces questions about another cover-up. Uh, but I should have worn the mask at the Mayo Clinic. In Phoenix, the president's photo op goes south. Outrage grows over the murder of a black jogger in Georgia, and a California court proves very costly for Quincy. I'm Celeste Headley. It's the Friday News Roundup on 1A. The Roundup of the Week's news continues with 1A from 10 to noon, here on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on listener-funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's the local news roundup explaining the presence of Mary C. Curtis from WCCB and Roll Call and Doss Helms from WFAE News, Jonathan Lowe from Spectrum News, and Joe Bruno from uh, WSOC-TV. Although politicians are individually choosing their phrases and their words to explain why we're reopening the economy and how we're doing so. The bottom line is that doing so is going to put people at risk for getting the virus. And the worst bottom line is that as a result, some people will die. Uh, and frontline workers in the medical field will continue to be at risk, and perhaps more so if this thing gets out of hand as will retail employees who have to interface with the public to do their jobs. Mary, we know that African-Americans are already bearing the brunt of this, both medically and economically, as are members of the Latino community. Uh, is the pressure to reopen another example of exacerbating an already bad problem for them? Yes, and I think you've seen the concerns. Uh, they are being hit uh, economically, so yes, they want to get back to work, but they want to be safe. Uh, we've seen that in big ways in that folks on the line at um, meat processing plants, which have been, uh, the president has said they're essential businesses, and they've had some incredible hot spots and virus outbreaks, including, you know, uh, we have that in this state. Uh, also, you saw initially here in Mecklenburg County, a lot of folks saying that they didn't have as much testing facilities in those communities. You see them in essential jobs, uh, and uh, you also see traditional inequality in the system uh, rear its head as well. Not as many people are insured. You have issues of medical bias and of underlying health conditions like diabetes uh, and asthma and so forth. So I think there is a concern. And if you look at these reopen protests, predominantly the folks there have been white, particularly the people with weapons in Michigan and other places. And there's a sense of whose life matters uh, so, yes, I, I think there is a, a concern there that the inequalities we see in the system will uh, happen and fall on black and brown people. And we've seen the, the fatalities hit them worse as well. And so, I, uh, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, Mike, I, I hope that, you know, here locally in Mecklenburg County, there has been, a, I think, since the beginning, Mecklenburg County has been one of the only ones, if not the only one in the state of North Carolina to be releasing demographic data, racial and ethnic data on um, uh, COVID-19 cases. And so, you know, Mecklenburg County, I'll just, you know, say that they have been doing what they can and trying to be ahead of this. Uh, we just, in the last two weeks, have been having the um, the testing sites uh, focused on areas in Mecklenburg County, uh, Weeping Willow, AME Zion, which is in on Milton Road in East Charlotte. Uh, I know that they were over uh, also in another area of East Charlotte trying to serve the Latino community. Um, so taking the atrium partnered with um, different organizations in the community to take the testing to uh, those, those disproportionate communities. So I, I really hope that uh, as we move into the reopening phase, that there is still that continued acknowledgement mm -hmm. and, and recognition of how this has disproportionately impacted people of color. And as we reopen, which we're doing at five o'clock today, stay at home will <laughs> remain in place. However, uh, people are gonna be allowed to go into retail stores. And I know that business executives and county officials talked about the idea of requiring face masks for people going into these stores to buy things. And I think decided against it. Mecklenburg County Health Director Gibby Harris said that will not be a requirement. So yesterday I asked her why. Mainly because of supply, number one. Um, we don't want to uh, uh, discriminate against someone just because they haven't been able to access masks or they don't have one. Um, but at the same time, uh, depending on our community to do the right thing 
anecdotally from what you've observed, and I know you guys go out into the field and do reporting, are people doing that? Are people doing the right thing? No, there's still a lot of masks missing, a lot of face coverings missing. And I think this is a, this is a possibility. They could require masks. It would just take a lot of education. Other cities and yeah. uh, counties are doing this across the United States. And really, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a mask. It right. could, if you're in a pinch, a bandana, anything to just cover right. your mouth and face is better than nothing. So it, know, and just the, the other day, Mike, I interviewed a, a, an event planner and it, she had the best tips I've heard in two weeks on how to socially distance. All it takes really, as Joe just said, is a coffee filter and <laughs> some sort of 100% cloth covering. I mean, I don't understand why that would not be through some sort of, as you said, education campaign, right. cover your face. That, that Those two items seem to be pretty economically uh, feasible for people to get. so as retail opens today gibby harris has said this is yes you can go into a store and you can buy something but do not be going into the malls and just walking <laughs> around strolling and window shopping get in get out because more people will be emerging for their from their homes now and, and things will start to get crowded and yesterday joe you asked gibby harris whose fault it will be if the number of hospitalizations or deaths increases with phase one what did she say I was trying to get that answer out of her and she kind of dodged the question. Basically, after weeks of pitching this worst case scenario, she now thinks that this scenario will not just sneak up on us. But the truth of the matter is, as more people are allowed to leave their houses, more people are going to be infected with COVID-19. And I think we do have to prepare for our numbers to spike up. And Mary, you mentioned something that the governor has been uh, wanting, wanting, wants us to be mindful of. You called them the three W's. What yes. are they? The, the wear, wear the mask, um, wash, you know, sanitize and wait, you know, social distance, don't rush into things. Um, and it, it's very difficult because it's very difficult to say we save this many lives or this many, this amount of people were not infected because we did social distance. You know, so we really, to say it's been working, it's hard for people to visualize. Um, so the governor has, yes, said, you know, let's continue to do these things, um, but it's only a suggestion. We've seen in other cities, the social distancing rules have been unequally uh, enforced. In I mean, Gibby Harris mentioned that yeah. one of the reasons they don't want to force masks on people is because they're hard to get, and they are hard to get. Uh, even if you order them online, uh, you it takes a while to get them sometimes, but everybody yeah. has a rag. They can <laughs> yeah. take an a old t-shirt yeah. uh -huh. and put it on your face. And <laughs> people just are not wearing them. And I think if They're I not. were a retailer who was having to demand that people either put one on or not come in, I think that would be a very tense situation because again, yeah, it, people are it, just are very passionate about this. And I think, wasn't there a case of someone who was shot over in another state? Yes, over yes a in a Walmart, because he demanded it disturbs, somebody. It disturbs me that it is optional for employees at grocery stores to wear them. They should all be wearing them, <laughs> particularly people who are dealing directly with raw meat. It's, I don't understand it. Uh, the White House yeah. is handling much of the responsibility for decision making, as we've said, surrounding this virus to the states. And at least here in North Carolina, many of those decisions have, have, have been handed down to local heirs. Everybody's kicking the can. And Joe, you spoke to the governor uh, for Channel 9 and mentioned that while Mecklenburg County has 1,800 cases, which makes this more critical for us, Avery County has no cases whatsoever. So, you know, maybe they should have a little different system. And he explained why it makes sense to have statewide orders. We know that transmission of the virus is more likely in, in crowded and urban areas. However, rural counties can be affected by this too. And that can be an additional problem because often healthcare facilities in rural areas can be more easily overwhelmed. But then he also mentioned a regional approach. I, if I'm not mistaken, is, is that a possible consideration given what he said about the virus essentially not recognizing borders? It does sound like that is a possibility in the future. And from what I understand is he really wanted this statewide floor in phase one. And now they're taking a look at whether they should ease restriction a little more in counties, um, you know, different parts of the state at different times. So like we could have a situation where 
you know, our coverage area has different restrictions in place where we go up to the mountain counties and you might be able to do a little more than you would here in Mecklenburg County. Again, this is just something he mentioned. He said he's talking to local health leaders as well as local lawmakers, but it does sound like a regional reopening approach is a possibility in the future. Another state- not, yeah. not every retailer will necessarily reopen, but for those that are, what are they, what have we heard from them? What restrictions are they placing? What preparations have they made? What restrictions are they placing on their customers, on their uh, employer, uh, on, on their employees? Can you walk into Macy's this afternoon at five o'clock and try on a shirt and say, eh, don't like that, put it back on the rack? I mean, can you do that? The fitting rooms is really interesting because there is no statewide policy on how department stores should handle them. It's kind of each store has their own different policy. Some stores are like setting aside the items for three days after someone tries them on. Another is immediately cleaning them before putting them back on the shelf. But I think what most stores are going to do is just close the fitting rooms altogether. Yeah. And they do have a 50% capacity. So there'll have to be some way to pretty much count how many people come in. Uh, so, and I actually wanted to correct myself. It wasn't at Walmart where the person was shot, but anyway, um, yeah, so they will have to, so I guess they'll have to have people, you know, counting people as people come in. Um, but it's interesting because most people go to a mall just to hang out and shop and look at window shop, um, and sit. So will they be some places in other uh, states have taken the chairs out so people cannot sit and congregate. So we'll just have to see. So phase two is scheduled at the moment to start uh, on May 22nd. Phase two will loosen things up considerably. I think that's when restaurants will be able to have uh, seating, reduced capacity seating, and some. And I think some theaters will be able to open. What criteria will state and local officials use to decide whether we're ready to go into phase two on May 22nd? Do it's basically the same criteria that they use to enter phase one. They need to see a continued decline or stabilization of certain metrics, including positive cases, uh, COVID-19 some drama cases, things along that nature. And we need to make sure that our contact tracing and our personal protective equipment supply is high. Jack emails, as long as we are not following up on positive test results with aggressive contact tracking and isolation, we have effectively surrendered to the virus. We are only slowing its spread through the community, but accepting that it will continue to spread unchecked. Are they going to do aggressive tracing once they have started to ramp up these tests? The one thing that encourages me on that is they wanted to, to hire 250 contact tracers in the state. They put out a link to an application and they got 4,000 applicants. So it seems like we're in good shape with contact tracing. Gibby Harris here in Mecklenburg County has said that they have about 70 people trained and only 30 are working right now. So we should be in good shape in Mecklenburg too. When this pandemic first began to take hold, uh, grocery stores noticed immediately a uh, disappearance of toilet paper and other paper products like paper towels and cleansers and uh, bread disappeared from the shelves. The bread's back. The milk is back. The paper towels situation is still sketchy, but now we're moving into meat shortages. What are stores doing to uh, avoid the fact that they'll be empty of, of any meat? Well, they're trying to limit purchases so you don't have somebody just coming and buying, you know, a month's worth of meat to put in their freezer. Uh, and they're saying there will be meat. There just might not be exactly what you're looking for at this time, which is kind of what we've seen in our grocery stores. The shortages seem to be patchy. And, and the shortages are, are the result of the fact uh, of meat packing plants. There are severe outbreaks in these meat packing plants. And I guess that's because they cannot practice social distancing. The way those production lines are set up, they, they are literally side by side and they, ha they can't hear each other. So they have to be close to each other so they can hear each other because of the noise made by the machines. So I've heard all this reporting on these meat packing plants and, and what's being done and, and how bad the outbreaks are and how they're being encouraged to stay open. I've never heard anybody ask this question. If you got people on the line who are asymptomatic or who are capable of spreading this virus, is the meat safe? <laughs> I'm not an expert say it on is. that, but I think I have read that it's that food transmission is not something that we're seeing a lot yeah. of. It, they, they say it is safe, but um, you know, I was looking into these things too, and we there are so many rules that they have pushed up that the timing on these uh, lines are incredible. Uh, you know, like 125 chickens processed a minute. And the workers have said, you don't even have time to 
cough or to look away. Uh, you're hitting one another. You're very close. They have very short breaks. Um, these are really, uh, you know, really petri dishes for this kind of infection. So they have been quite worried. Yeah, the speed of those lines, it's just think Lucy and Ethel in the chocolate factory. Yeah, factory. That's, it's that's the problem. So the General Assembly on Saturday, uh, this is old news because it's almost a week old, but they, I'm not sure many people understand this. They unanimously passed coronavirus relief and recovery legislation, Jonathan, that will spend and reserve about $1.6 billion for this purpose. Where is this money slated to go? Uh, it's like you said, 1.6 billion, Mike, and it's it's going to a number of different areas. They passed it on Saturday, as you said, and it's it's got money for testing, tracing, um, recovery needs, access to broadband, because we know that there are a lot of kids across the state. I believe 3,000 TMS students haven't been heard from because they don't have access to the internet. So it includes money. Um, let me see here. It's a long list of uh, like three million for non-digital learning instructional resources, um, just a, a long list of stuff. And then also there's money in there for um, human impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, electronic devices to access remote learning, just a, it's a long list. I mean, the breakdown is, is pretty um, extensive. It's 50 million for additional PPE. So that's something that we've been talking a lot about, but that was past Saturday. The prisons have also been a, a focus of a lot of people because evidently outbreaks are going on in prisons. And some people are saying it's a death sentence for inmates who have not uh, committed serious uh, capital crimes. They're, you're putting them in, in harm's way. And then this week, there was a story about inmates uh, from the women's prison in Raleigh continuing to clean state offices at the Department of Public Safety headquarters for three weeks after other prison release work programs were suspended because of COVID-19 concerns. Were these work release programs suspended because of concerns about inmates contracting the virus from outside and bringing it into the prison? Or was it, was it uh, suspended because they were worried about people getting it in the prison and taking it out? Well, it's, it's a combination of, of all of that. As you can know, uh, imagine prisons are places where you really can't social distance. And you also have a lot of people who work in the prisons who then go home to their families. So the concerns are, are all of those things. And you did have a female inmate die of the COVID this week. Um, we've had, I believe, four in the prison system. Uh, and 90% of the, of the cases, it's, we've had more than 625 positive cases or so. Um, 90% uh, uh, from either the News Correctional Institution or the North Carolina Instit Correctional Institution for Women. So prisoners and civil rights groups, prisoners' rights and civil rights groups have really argued that these folks are being ignored. And so uh, the state officials have said that they are going to allow them to serve, uh, particularly at risk, outside, and they will be able to release some of them. So Debbie Harris that. announced yesterday, Mecklenburg County's health director, that uh, they will start increasing the number of tests they're doing. We'll come back and talk about that and about what schools are doing in the face of all this, particularly with regard to graduation in Charlotte Talks. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Taylor Richards and Congress. The Phillips Place store is reopening Saturday at 10 a.m. and will adhere to all government recommended safety standards in order to protect their clients and staff. More info at trcstyle.com. And Novant Health reminding the community that people can get the care they need with safety measures in place. More at novanthealth.org slash return to care. The Senate returned to work on Capitol Hill this week. House Democrats are working on a fifth coronavirus related stimulus package that could be passed with or without Republican support as early as next week. A model cited by the White House on Monday projects that the U.S. coronavirus death count will rise to more than 130,000 people by August as cities begin to reopen and lifting and begin lifting stay at home orders. Those are just some of the stories that we're talking about as the news roundup continues with the national slant in 20 minutes at 10 on 1A.
It's your world. We help you explore it. Colombia's coronavirus lockdown has thrown many of these migrants out of work. It's your community. We help you understand it. He told the State Board of Education one thing the task force will look at is improving remote learning. We know that remote learning has to be more user-friendly and more practical. WFAE's Morning Edition is an essential way to start your day and stay connected to your world. Listen weekday mornings from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's the local news roundup. And Dallas Helms is here from WFAE News. Jonathan Lowe from Spectrum News. Mary C. Curtis from WCCB TV. And uh, Roll Call and Jonathan and, and Joe uh, Bruno from WSOC TV Channel 9 Eyewitness News. Uh, testing throughout the country is woefully short of what experts would like to see. And Joe, you spoke with Governor Cooper this week. Your first question to him was about whether it was wise to begin reopening when so few people in North Carolina have been tested and so few tests are available. What did he tell you? He says that, you know, we've hit our metrics, so it is time to start reopening, but his goal is to increase testing significantly. Right now we're running about five to 7,000 tests a day. He says we will hit 10,000 tests a day pretty soon. Mecklenburg. North Carolina is among the lowest testing rate states in the country. We rank 45th out of 50 states. I believe South Carolina is at 49th or 50th. Why? The issues have been mainly around having enough supplies for testing. Why? Is that our fault? Is that because we, we didn't order them, because we didn't care, because the government didn't send them to us, because the governments are bidding against each other in, in this uh, this ridiculous system that they've set up at the federal level? I mean, why? From what I understand is that there are other states that are getting more testing supplies in North Carolina. Part of the reason is because other states are being hit harder than North Carolina is at this moment. And, and also you do see a lack of a coordinated effort from the federal government. So you have these cases of states trying to make deals on their own with other countries. You know, the Maryland governor, uh, Larry Hogan, whose wife is of co uh, Korean descent, um, you know, making deals and then trying to protect the equipment as it comes into the states, because in some cases, the federal government has uh, is going to confiscate it. So it has been a really patchwork system. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case in North Carolina. But well, yesterday, 16 North Carolina Republican state senators complained that other states are leaving us in the dust when it comes to testing. And they asked our Democratic governor why. Uh, was there, has there been a response? Is the problem with the Cooper administration or does it tie back to the federal government? Has there been a response? I'm There's not, not one that I'm aware response, of. No, but uh, like I said, it's just we don't have the supplies right now. And if you think about, I think that question I asked the governor was completely fair because really we're only testing about 700 people on average in Mecklenburg County, the state's largest county. Uh, that's pretty pathetic uh, when you think about how many people live in Mecklenburg County. Now the health director says she has a plan to dramatically boost that number. But the fact that we are sitting here on May 8th and we were only testing 500 to 700 people a day. There's no other way to put that. Well, yesterday I asked uh, on this program, I asked Mecklenburg County Health Director Gibby Harris uh, about testing. The state has recommended that all counties develop a plan to test 5% of their population in 30 days. Um, what I can say about Mecklenburg County is that we have tested at, at least 2.5% 2 uh, 2 of our population already. Um, since the beginning, um, but we are looking at ramping that up to do the 5% in the next 30 days. Now, I knew that she was going to announce yesterday while we were talking on that program, uh, a, a, an increased amount of testing. And I asked if she would share the details and she said, no, you'll hear later this afternoon. So later that afternoon, yesterday, she ramped that up to 8% uh, at, by announcing this new plan. So will they be what will they be testing for? Just the presence of the virus or will they be testing for antibodies? No, they're not moving into antibody testing at this point. They're going to focus on trying to do 1,800 tests a day, which I understand they have been able to hit the past two days, which is why we're seeing a little bit of a spike in numbers. 
but they're gonna really focus on three different groups for this testing. The first will be largely the people that they've been targeting so far, people with moderate to severe symptoms, 65 and older residents, people with underlying health conditions, healthcare workers, and first responders. The second group of people that they're gonna focus on testing are people with mild symptoms, people with known medium risk, medium high risk exposure and people undergoing medical procedures. And then that third group of people they wanna expand testing to are the people who support critical infrastructures, which wasn't really defined. So I'm not exactly clear what that means and asymptomatic people. The goal is to test 5% of the population in the next 30 days. So that would be about 13,000 tests a week. I believe that critical infrastructure, Joe, because I asked a follow up on that to someone else. And I think those are would be like city uh, transit workers, like public bus workers, light rail, um, sanitation workers, those frontline type people. Mm -hmm. Transit workers have been well, hit gonna hard. Be, yeah. She's going to be rolling this out <laughs> in three tiers. What's the separation between the tiers? In other words, how, do, how, how, how long will it take to go from uh, tier number one, which they're launching now, mm -hmm. to tier number three? She said they were separated by a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, uh, she, and she said that these tests, that this increasing testing will likely result in higher virus counts in the county. But yesterday on this program, Dr. Ralph Barrick, who's an epidemiologist and an in, in immunologist at UNC Chapel Hill, one of the world's foremost experts on coronaviruses and the man running the lab, developing these two uh, uh, leading drugs for treatment, including remdesivir, said that testing is an imperative and we should not be in the position of playing catch up. CDC, uh, recognized around the world as one of the great public health institutions that has been modeled after by many countries, uh, was the pinnacle of success in testing and, um, and mediating tests across the United States. And prior to this pandemic, everyone would have said the U.S. was the absolutely most prepared country in the world for a pandemic, and we failed miserably um, at the top. There's no question. We failed miserably at the top. It's uh, a sad state of affairs, and uh, we are still paying the, the price of a uh, two-month window where we um, lagged on testing development and had testing failures. So, Anne, you have been digging into how online working, uh, online learning is working out, and you discovered the answer is not well at all. A lot of kids are falling through the cracks. Talk about that. Well, um, and we've known that. We've been saying that for weeks now, but um, I was looking at how you even quantify that. And however you do by the roughest measures, it's tens of thousands of students across North Carolina. Sort of the, the most basic measure is has the school even been able to contact this student? And let me be clear, I think they've made often heroic efforts, not just calling and texting and things like that, but in some cases, uh, teachers and others have gone to homes and knocked on doors if they can't find some. CMS had, um, as of Friday, more than 3,000 students on what they called their zero contact list, and that was with not all of their schools reporting in yet. Um, Union County said, as of, I think, April 25th, they said, well, we've reached 84% of our students, but that other percentage is like 6,700 students. So you figure Union and Charlotte Mecklenburg account for about an eighth of the overall population. So you could be looking at 80,000 students that we just don't know where they are. You know, well, they move why, across county why, lines. Why don't, we, why don't we know where they are? And why isn't online education or checking in with teachers on the phone or whatever process there is in place for that mandatory, given the mandatory nature of elementary school and middle school education? Well, I don't know how you make something mandatory for a family you can't reach. And, and this is true of at any time. You have people who are moving. You have people, you have students who rack up, you know, 60, 70 absences, and there are again then processes to track them down. Well, now consider that these are not normal times when you have, you know, all this economic upheaval. The student you can't reach may not even be in your school district or your county anymore. They may have moved somewhere. And that's one thing I don't have no idea if somebody like, like just moves into Charlotte now with school age kids, how do they get them connected to online learning or something? So and then connection, we're also talking about do you have Wi-Fi access? Do you have the devices you need? And even, I, for instance, I spoke with a Spanish-speaking mother who has a Chromebook and she's in touch. So she would check all those boxes, but she has 
three school age kids who are all at the same K-8 school. They have one Chromebook. And she said, even within her family, there's a lot of difference that there's, you know, some of her teachers, her kids' teachers speak Spanish, some don't. That, you know, there's one child who's really struggling and she's just not been able to make that connection to get him the help he needs. So what is emerging is not a very pretty picture. And in fact, Cheryl Turner, who's the head of Sugar Creek Charter School, where most students come from disadvantaged backgrounds, had a grim assessment about what the next school year will look like. As far as what students are going to get out of this year and the kids we can't find, and even the ones who are participating, we are taking the attitude that we're teaching two grades in every grade next year. So what does that mean, Ann? They'll be, that they'll be playing catch-up, that they'll be teaching second and third grade for third graders? Uh, how's that going to work? I think she's talking about having to do a lot of catch-up, and I think everybody agrees that that's going to have to happen. Um, this bill that was passed Saturday that Jonathan was talking about uh, does include $70,000 for what they've kind of referred to as a jumpstart program that might start in early August. It's really unclear how they would do that. It would be optional, and it would be for kids who need help catching up. How do you identify them? How do you serve them? You know, we've just talked about the peak coming in July and maybe later. It's not at all clear that in early August, we're going to be able to just say, hey, y'all come on into the school. Mm-hmm. That we're going to have buses that can get, you know, it's just, there are so many unknowns. And it's not because people aren't trying. It's, it's just a really big challenge. And school has been scheduled to start earlier in August than normal because of uh, this catch up problem. And that poses a problem in Mecklenburg because they were scheduled to start later because of the Republican National Convention, which is still scheduled to go on. So when does schedule when does school allegedly start? August 17th. And what we'd had before was a calendar law that it gave a little wiggle room, but it basically was saying August 24th would be the first date you could open. And now they're saying everybody, charter schools, districts, no matter what your school board has approved, August 17th is the day, and I'm not really and, sure. Uh, well, Iredell Statesville schools will start even earlier, August 5th. Why? I'm not sure they can now. I think under this okay. new law, they have to start August 17th as well, which means tearing up their calendar. So they made some more decisions about grading, and it's really this is really very uh, difficult for me to understand, so maybe you understand it. Uh, <laughs> The end of year tests will not be given this year. So third graders who take these end of year tests, which will decide on whether they move to the fourth grade, I guess, will go back to school as fourth graders, and then they will give those tests. So what happens if you're sitting in a fourth grade classroom and you take the test and you don't pass it? Do they send you back? No, I think what there would be is a lot of remediation. And again, this just points to the huge challenges that are going to be on educators whenever and however students come back, because there are going to be kids who are way behind. And um, and they're going to have to give a big test within 10 days. The, The law spells out within the first 10 days of being back in school, you have to give this test. So... And, no, I, and we don't know if they're going to get extra pay. The, the law also extended the school year by five days, but it hasn't provided any money for extra pay. Jonathan. So I'll, I'm just looking, Mike, at the, the list of, of, of funds just to go back to that relief bill, because it's, I, I guess I, I figure it's, it's key to what we're talking about here. But there is a lot of money for um, like there's 70 million for summer learning programs. So uh, there, there's a focus on helping uh, during the summer. There's also another um, three million for non-digital learning instructional. So there, there is money that's going to be put towards helping kids in whatever way they can. And decisions were made on graduation this this week. Uh, finally, uh, somebody mentioned maybe ha- holding them in drive-in movie theaters. Find one, uh, but but in uh, in Cabarrus County at least they're going to use Charlotte Motor Speedway, right? Yep, that's the plan. They announced that um, they're going to, I would gather it'd be one school at a time, and I'm not quite clear on where you sit when you drive up and watch the big video, but then uh, you drive up to the track and pick up your diploma. And in Mecklenburg, they're holding a vote among seniors about what to do, and that vote result will come out on Monday. No, they have made no announcement yet? No. No, okay. but the, the, the three choices are very, very similar. They all involve a video pre-recorded. You get your speeches, you get the recalling of the names, and then just the the only choice that is really being given, and I'm curious about whether seniors will find this disappointing, the only choice is whether you do this at school somehow and then you drive up to the school and you get it, or whether you get your diploma in the mail, or whether you get your diploma in the mail 
and then there's a delayed ceremony. Drive-in diplomas. Uh, very quickly, Joe, because we're running out of time, I want to talk about the city budget. Uh, the, the, the city's going through an economic shortfall, just as businesses are, because tax revenues are way down. But the city budget, uh, and I think it's $22 million they're short, but the city budget came out this week with no tax cuts, no layoffs, and no tax increase. I mean, no tax increase and no layoffs is what I'm trying to say. Go ahead. Yeah, the city manager did a great job with this budget. He's filling the gap by reducing some expenses. He's shifting some funds and he's eliminating uh, some vacant positions, freezing the hiring of others. I think about 26 positions that are vacant currently are being eliminated. Uh, and, you know, city employees are still getting a raise, which is great news. Uh, the budget doesn't raise taxes. It doesn't delay projects, doesn't lay off any employees. Employees and it doesn't reduce the bond referendum money. Really, there's a whole lot to nitpick with this budget. And city manager Marcus Jones put a pretty positive spin on this. We know that we can get through this uh, maybe better than any other city our size. Did he explain why? The city's been preparing for this and, you know, he has a great budget. Kudos to him and the budget staff. Wow. So how are we making up for this $22 million shortfall? Must be cutting something somewhere, right? Yeah, he's reducing some expenses and shifting some funds from different accounts. And he, like I said, he is eliminating some positions that are currently vacant. So he's able to fill in that gap there without having to dip into the savings account, the rainy day funds. Sounds a little bit like the Great Recession 2.0. Uh, hope, hopefully not. Uh, that's Joe Bruno, for reporter for WSSC TV Channel 9. Joe uh, Jonathan Lowe was here, for, uh, reporter anchor for Spectrum News. Mary C. Curtis with Roll Call and WCCB TV. And Ann Doss Helms, our education reporter here at WFAE News. Thank you all for the hour. Stay safe. Phase one at five o'clock. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from Mazda of South Charlotte. Wendy Herkey is the executive producer. The senior producer is Aaron Kiever. Our producer is Chris Miller. Our assistant producer is Jesse Steinmetz. Jennifer Warsham is our production assistant. And our engineer is Joby Sprinkle. For more information about Charlotte Talks, go to wfae.org slash charlotte talks. Hi. 